So good evening, everybody. Welcome to episode number 54 of my weekly Jump Game Review series. I am your host, Chris Gogolin. Thank you for joining us tonight. We've got some good things to talk about on the show tonight. We've got foil preview cards to look at. We've got set 11 spoilers to look at. We've got OCS games to possibly check out and watch. We've got a game link for a game that uh, has a matchup that we don't haven't featured a lot on this show. So uh, we got some good stuff going on tonight. Uh, thank you guys all for joining. Of course, we do the obligatory reminders to make sure you renew your subscriptions by hitting that purple button up in the top, or at least following us if you're not. If you have an Amazon Prime account, be sure and link it to Twitch. You get one free subscription each month. Uh, to give away, you just have to renew it each month, and uh, that's that's just a compliment for having Amazon Prime. You get a free subscription for Twitch. Hopefully, you'll use it for us, but certainly use it for somebody. Somebody out there deserves to get uh, you know your support for that. Uh, we give out real stuff in response for that support. There are some great foils that have been given away so far. For those, I think I've shown those off a few times before, um, and a lot of those have been mailed out or will be getting mailed out soon, along with a bunch of OCS foils going out in the uh, near future. I started putting those all together this weekend to mail out to a whole bunch of people. Uh, a lot of them went out to the MPC, for people who were there, got at least the first couple months. Uh, now I'm gonna circle back and the people who haven't gotten any yet should get all four months if they've played continuously, or at least up, you know, February, March, April, and May, whatever they've played, will all be getting sent out soon. So you guys can start getting some OCS foils in the mail by the end of the month. To, uh, to use in your local league events, states, regionals, those kinds of things going this summer. Uh, Belugo, playing in my first paper event this weekend, any suggestions what to replace Imperial Supply with in map? Uh, yeah, all the stuff map was playing before Imperial Supply came along. Um, you know, it's not like a straight, just replace it card for activation. Map had good activation already. Um, it was fine with that. Imperial Supply just let it get a really crazy turn one to try and get further ahead of its opponents. You're not going to replicate that without Imperial Supply. So you kind of just go back to playing the standard way Map was always played. Uh, look at deck lists from the Endor Grand Prix uh, Worlds, you know, last year. And, uh, and just go with one of those. I feel like my face is a little bigger than it usually is. So we're going to hang on a second. There we go. Um, it's not a specific card for card thing that you can just swap stuff out with. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there were plenty of us at the MPC this year. There were people running the Imperial Supply version, and there were people playing the regular Blaster version or the Alert My Star Destroyer version. Um, you know, so there are other versions of map that are successful and have been successful for a very long time now. So uh, watch any of the previous game reviews. Uh, there's, if you go to the uh, the home page there, you can find out all about which videos have featured map. And 90% uh, of them did not feature Imperial Supply. So I think that's easy to play there. Uh, nothing going on right now in the old lobby. We'll take a quick peek at the old OCS standings. Uh, Paul McWelsh sitting in the first spot right there right now. Uh, that's what's what nine and three. Uh, it's a good it's a good month. Probably not gonna hold up, especially with a thirty eight percent. Unless you know his opponents pick up some more wins and boost him up quite a bit. Nine and three is already kind of uh, questionable. Usually it's ten and twos who are missing out. Um, and then with having, if you had a great win percentage, if you were like nine and three with like a 55% win percentage, maybe there's some possibility of some maneuvering that could happen there. Um, but yeah, uh, Tom already qualified, could certainly uh, win his last game here and jump ahead and then possibly create an at-large bid. Uh, Silver Glenn, if he wins, he would get the 30 and his percentage might be just enough to move ahead of Paul. Um, but moving further down here, Brenson's got three games left to play. He could get the 32 if he won out. Uh, but this is the the most likely one to qualify. Off to a good start, 7-0, and uh, Eric Hunter. I don't know how to pronounce it. Ototoy? Uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. So he's looking to be in a pretty good spot there at 7-0. Then you got some 6-2s, and 5-2s. Uh, moving down here, still lots of games left to play for people, but uh, seven and zero certainly a good spot. 
uh, you know, winning three of his last five to go 10-2 and two should be pretty good. He already has a pretty good win percentage uh, there, so he seems likely to qualify this month. And then possibly some of these other guys who have already qualified could get in there and uh, create an extra at-large bid. Uh, we could also see somebody else from down here make a run uh, with some games, uh, possibly Brunson as well. But still about two weeks left. Uh, we'll get the July sign-ups up in a little bit. Um, but I expect to see a lot of people playing their games this weekend because this weekend is online weekend for Star Wars, June 22nd and 23rd. Yay! What does that mean? Well, let's look at the details. Saturday and Sunday, online event. You just play online, and then you email somewhere down here. These are the foils. We'll come back to those in a second. Here's what you do. You take a screenshot from your game, or you provide the game link, a little description, and you send it via email to this, volunteers at starwarsccg.org. Include your physical mailing address, otherwise we can't mail you out your cool prize stuff. And as we scrolled through these above, uh, two years ago, it was this awesome Grievous and Isla hologram foils. Uh, very cool. Uh, last year, it was Captain Phasma and Commander Cody. I know a lot of people use the Phasma. Cody is a little bit more exclusive with the uh, you know the types of decks that he gets sees play in are, aren't quite as popular, but uh, still a very cool image. And I'm going to do the first spoiler now. I'm going to show you one of the two cards. We're going to break these up and stagger these throughout the show. Uh, what do you think? Light side or dark side? Which foil do you guys want to see, light side or dark side? Ten seconds. One vote for dark, one vote for light. Oh! CRG at the buzzer. Light. All right, so we're going to show the light foil first. The light side foil is Kit Fisto, one of the newest set 10 cards. And it is his hollow foil, which I think is pretty sweet. There we go. Get that a little better, a little less glare. Uh, I like this one very much. I think it's really cool. I think all these are really cool. Um, so that is the light side foil. We'll do the dark side one in a little bit, along with uh, our set 11 spoilers. But So yeah, so you play a game, which you should be doing anyway, because there's you know it's Jemp and it's a weekend, and there's all kinds of fun games and stuff going on. Plenty of people ready to play and wanting to play. Uh, so you can jump in there and get that taken care of. Whoa, I think I just moved the wrong one. There we go. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, you give us your physical mailing address, and then we can include those cards and get them sent out to you. Last year, I think we had like 60-something people, 70, almost 70 people submit uh, game links and whatnot. So I would expect that number to be higher because there's that many people playing in the OCS, plus all the people who don't ordinarily play uh, in those types of competitive environments. And Foreman, thank you for subscribing with your Twitch Prime account. Very welcome to have you here for month number one. See, it's just that easy. You just click the button. Bam, subscribed. So that's all you have to do with about that. Uh, but yeah, we got, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we get uh, 75, 80 people this year. I'd love to get these foils out. You're going to love the dark side one, too. It's uh, also a very cool one. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, the other big thing coming up, the pre-registration has now been posted. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week for the... North American Continentals, the John Anderson Memorial Tournament. Uh, you've got just under a month left to qualify to register. Uh, you can still register later after July 13th, but if you do it before July 13th, you get five dollars off. So who likes you know save a little money? Uh, plus, you also become eligible to get the uh, the AI foil, which is EPP Ray Ray with lightsaber alternate image. Very cool foil. We showed that off last week. Uh, I will not show that again this week. You can watch last week's video uh, to see that foil. Um, I don't feel like taking it out. But 
Yeah, so that's coming up here, and uh, set 11 will be released prior to then. We got that information uh, was posted earlier. It's in the old uh, announcements thread here. So set 11 information, uh, expected release date, uh, tournament legal on August 2nd, which means the PDF should come out one to two weeks ahead of time. The spoiler, the full spoiler list should be out two weeks ahead of time, um, right around the time of the European Championship. So these guys hopefully will have the list, or at least a lot of spoilers will have been released by then. Uh, hopefully the full list will come out this weekend. That'll give these guys something else to talk about in between games and, you know, theory craft about some of the new cards and what kind of stuff they've got going on there. That's coming up mid-July for all of you European players. Uh, it's in Amsterdam, or American players who just want to go to Amsterdam. Uh, could be a good time. So, uh... Yeah, so North American Continentals is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. European Championships, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And then those all lead up to the World Championships at the end of September in beautiful scenic Bochum, Germany. So we'll get all that stuff going. But here's all the pre-registration information for you North American players. You just click on this little pre-registration thing here. It gives you all the information about all the different swag items that you can get. Uh, there's some type of collectible John Anderson pins and a lanyard and uh, some other surprise special item. And then here's the links to the passes. we got eight players signed up already in just the first week or so we've been doing this. I certainly expect to see these numbers climb as we get closer to the actual event. Oh, actually, I have to go back and sign up somebody. I made a promise. I forgot. Uh, I promised one of uh, Walseth could give out as a prize. I'm going to do that now before I forget. Um... Whoever won his league event at this uh, Rosemount Championship, that was it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mark Walseth, Hall of Famer Mark Walseth, uh, does a lot of events. He's a teacher in Minnesota. He runs a lot of events and after-school programs with uh, his students. Uh, and many of them come back year after year as they grow up and grow with the game. Um, some of the his earliest students, people like... Uh, Mitch Nyland, uh, uh, Jake Nelson, those kind of guys have been playing competitive Star Wars for the last 10, 12 years. Um, and they continue to come back over and over again. And new players keep getting added to that. Uh, Charlie Arlinson, Brian Mischke, you know, guys who are doing very well in tournaments right now. Uh, Charlie's actually playing an OCS game as we speak. So I promised that Walseth could give out as a prize this year, whichever one of his first-time players, one of his newest kids, uh, I would give them, I would pay their entry fee to U.S. Continentals for whichever kid it was. See, look at them all playing there. You got Brian, Charlie, and some of these younger kids. Look, look, it's a girl playing Star Wars. <gasps> There's actually a few of them, I believe, in his, uh, in his group. So, uh, very awesome to see that. And I forget, I believe it was Logan. Logan. There he is. So we have to sign up Logan. I'll take care of paying for it later. Appreciate you guys just bearing with me while I get this updated. go get that updated get him signed up there a promise is a promise so we'll get that taken care of and then yeah so you can find the links here to go to the pc store to make the payment to take care of that stuff that's all right there uh the european events they do their pre-registration directly through them since that really we want to convert the money to american money and then back to euros and all that kind of stuff so uh i'm sure there's links in these threads here about how to sign up or to come in advance or you just pay cash to menzel or whoever's running the tournaments at the events um, and all the details can be found right there i do want to pop into this game at least for a minute or two uh because he's playing black sun and we all know that there's been an ongoing bug with Black Sun for a little while now. Um, so we're going to see if it happens here. But it's also just an interesting game to watch, at least for a minute or two. 
For those of you unaware, the Black Sun glitch. Um, occasionally, the objective will just suddenly forget that bounty hunters are Black Sun agents. So on the front side of the objective, you'll see that it says remainder of game, bounty hunters and information brokers become Black Sun agents. Somehow, every once in a while, it will just forget this part of the, the game text, and then suddenly you can't deploy two-thirds of your characters. Um, they've been trying to look at it and fix it for a while now, but they can't seem to figure out what's causing it. They can't seem to duplicate what actually triggers it. Some people speculate that it, you know Boba Fett Bounty Hunter, when he goes out of play, it may be causing it, but it's happened in games where that he didn't go out of play, and then there's other games where you, you play the whole game completely through and nothing ever happens. So um, it's a random little glitch. So playing Black Sun in a competitive format is a little dicey, a little dangerous. But Apollyon is on the GEMP programming team, so he uh, must have some extra information that maybe it's been fixed, or maybe he's just uh, seeing if he can't get it to break, so that way he'll be able to review his own game and fix the problem for everybody else. That's very brave of him to take one for the team like that. Excited to sign up for Continentals and play in my first major. And we are excited to have you, as well as uh, some of the other first-time players, uh, coming out to that event. Um, there's definitely no better experience than coming to your first tournament um, and really just seeing who all these people that you've been playing against online actually are. Um, and just getting to meet people, getting to see, you know, get a feel for the environment, see all the different crazy decks that people are using, um, and just talking about, and just hang out and play some board games, have a drink or two, and, uh, you know, socialize with some of the coolest people on the planet. Um, looks like Charlie's playing the first turn flip version of Diplo. Uh, what this version does is it runs strike planning to pull generals, which you'd normally see because they get Mon Mothma and like General uh, Kraken. So the Tantive has a pilot or something like that. Uh, but this particular version runs squadron assignments, so you pull, not Bosk, you pull General Calrissian, who deploys minus two aboard the Falcon. You play squadron assignments, you reveal him, you get the, the Falcon, Falcon, which can make an additional move. So you deploy that for five, you pay one to ship dock to move uh, the droids over to the Falcon, uh, and then you move from Tatooine for free, so then you just move to Alderaan, and then typically it can make the second move, and then it can either move back to Tatooine, um, so it's back at a battleground system, uh, or if you happen to get Chandrilla out, you move the Tantiv over to Chandrilla, you move the Falcon back to Chandrilla, and now you've got a pretty, uh, you know, Decent little space force for turn one. Um, it not only cost you six force to do it seven, because the second move will cost you. Um, so if you get seven force, so you give yourself one, two, three, plus one for you is four. If you started Wackling as your extra effect, you'd have five, so then you would need two from your opponent, which some dark side decks will give you. If you're playing something like Hunt Down or whatnot, you probably won't have the two icons uh, to do all of it, but at least you can get the droids delivered to Alderaan, turn one, uh, and then go upload any card you want. Uh, this turn seems like Charlie's taking a different approach, though, and he's just moving, because I guess Alderaan wasn't there. He had to get, maybe he activated it or something, so he had to get uh, a ground site. He pulled this farm. He moved over everybody to Chandrilla. They're both getting a mountain of force activation here on turn two. 16 is pretty ridiculous. Um, other thing I also noticed is it looks like, yep, he's using R2, D2, uh, not the typical R2 in R2 and 3PO that we normally see. He's using this guy uh, while he's at a scomp link. He adds a light side icon. I'm sorry, I forgot Tanif adds one too. So you give yourself one, two, three, plus one for you is four. Tanif adds one is five. Now, if you instead of starting Walkling, you use this droid here, because he's got a scout plank, so that gives you six, um, which is enough to do it all, turn one to at least move to Alderaan. Um, and then if your opponent gives you any icons, it could be possible that you move, uh, have that extra force to move back. So that's how that all works out there. And then that gives you the ability to uh, complete, the, get the plans there delivered. That lets you go upload any card from your reserve deck, which you can then pick based on 
your matchup and then uh, get exactly whatever you need to go from there. Going to be playing games after the event in Minnesota, Chris. Will I be playing games after the event, like board games and stuff? Possibly. Depends how well things go. Um, you know, Friday night we're all going to the baseball game, so that'll be a good time hanging out with everybody. Um, you know, Saturday, if I make top eight, well, then I got to focus on that a little more than hanging up and playing board games. Um, if I don't, well, then I have some extra free time on my hands and I can just kind of, you know, play, you know, standard backup decks, day two decks for Sunday. Um, I don't have to start getting, going to the tank, trying to out Fox all the other people that have made the top eight cut. So, which is nerve wracking and, uh, vomit inducing sometimes. Say to run in your second tournament in North Carolina this weekend. Awesome. Um, I know you guys have been just starting getting some live events going. And, uh, you know, I know there's some guys in South Carolina who came up to the MPC. Um, I'm sure North Carolina is a lot closer for them. So hopefully a few of them will uh, make the trip over. And uh, there's like five or six of those guys active in that area now. So, uh, yeah, you guys can have a nice uh, 10, 12 person North Carolina event. Uh, that's exciting. That's, it's been a region that hasn't had. A lot of activity in a while, so nice to get uh, a little bump up going there. All right, so we got Bale on the Tantiv. Ray coming down. Ray's going to get a used pile search. He's got, I must be allowed to speak out, an 11 force. So we're probably going to see a couple more people hit the table and get some more used pile searches, whether it be uh, Leia, Chewy, could be Lando, could be Luke. I believe this deck runs the the new Jedi Luke, who doesn't deploy where they're occupying. So, not the most uh, effective guy for battling. So you might want to see somebody else here. Uh, Bosk is going to limit them to one battle destiny, where they have a smuggler or wookie. So, uh, Ray comboing up with Solo will not get a second destiny. Uh, the EPP Chewie or anything like that. Also would be limited. Of course, Boss could just get shot and sorry about the mess or something like that. But I think you'd rather go after P59 if you had a sorry about the mess. You hit him, get him out of the picture, and then it's just Boss by himself who doesn't really do anything. Looks like Apollyon has left the room. So we're going to pop out of this game for a little bit. Uh, we're going to look at our first set 11 spoiler, because that's always fun. So new card coming out in set 11. Sabalba, he always wins. He always wins. Adds two to power of anything he pilots. De okay, deploys free to Mos Espa. Well, that's pretty good for the Wado objective deck. Uh, having another guy other than Ozil who deploys for free. Uh, while on Tatooine, attrition against opponent is plus one here, and your force generation is plus one, so that's pretty good. So he deploys for free to Mos Espa, but you could use him at any Tatooine site and get attrition plus one and force generation plus one. If opponent just lost two force to your slave, that's the flip side of the objective. We'll look at that in a second. You may draw the top card of your reserve deck. Normally deploy three, four, fit five. Not the best ratios for an alien, but taking into account scum likely to reduce that. Uh, two, five is pretty decent stats. Adding two to anything there, adding four power on the ground. Could be easily doubled up to eight with, uh, with Java in a scum deck. Um, but fairly likely most of his play we'll see in this uh, You're a Slave objective which, for those of you who forget what that does, so you've got the Wado objective here. When you flip it, you have Wado, and if you occupy Moss Espa, then you flip it, and then you can, during your deploy phase, place a card from hand face down on your side of the table. Opponent must choose to lose two force, and you put that card in your use pile, or they use two force, and then you deploy that card for free. Um, if they use two, and it's a card you can't deploy, like it's an interrupt or something, like you were bluffing, then you lose two force plus that card. A lot of people use this as a way to get, uh, you know, f big stuff out for free. Uh, your executor, your EPP malls, invaders and stuff, blizzard walkers. 
Um, there is a shield that changes free, so it makes it cost two force instead of being free. But deploying the executor for two force is a pretty good bargain still. Uh, even deploying Darth Maul or Vader or Blizzard Walker for two instead of their normal six or seven is a pretty good discounted price. Um, so basically what Sebulba does is, is if they choose to lose two, which would make you put that card in your use pile, you get to draw a new card off the top of your reserve deck. So you get kind of your hand size back. So that's not bad. He's a, he's a utility card, um, you know, for the, for the Watto deck and objective. You still don't have a way to pull him, though. That, at least not that's been revealed. Um, so, you, you know, he would still have to get him into hand and something. So Endor Shield uh, for Ozil may still seem to be the more uh, consistent way to uh, to pull that off but that is one of our first set 11 spoilers so we got one more set 11 spoiler to go we got one more online play weekend foil to go through Let's see if they're back internet keeps dying okay Let's see what back to the game here and see what they got going on obviously uh, we'd like to get Oof, don't know what happened there. Apparently he's on the Falcon as a pilot, but it looks like he's at the site. This ball was Destiny 2. Yeah. And the Chubana pulls him, so you can replace Endor Shield with that effect. on table. Once per turn, may use one force to look through opponent's loss pile and place all docking bays you find there out of play. Well, that seems handy. Once per game, may deploy Sebulba from reserve deck reshuffle. So if you started this over Endor Shield, instead of getting a free Ozil, you get a free Sebulba. But Endor Shield gets you a second guy. Still go into a shield. Um, unless people suddenly start playing decks with extra docking bays again, which, you know, cat wall. Um, but there's a shield that cancels that. Um, I don't see this being uh, a, a very viable alternate start. Unless by some miracle you're doing some crazy, and I do mean crazy, version of Wado that is also relying on like scum or something like that where you're, you're not going to play. Uh, any Imperials, you're just going to use aliens to, and, uh, you know, droids and things like that to complete your Watto objective. I don't know how you'd get the audience chamber and all the other stuff out. You know, maybe play a couple copies of Nemoidian Advisor uh, to pull the audience chamber or Jabba's Palace and just kind of take over Tatooine with a bunch of aliens and objective shenanigans. But, I mean, that's that that's way, that's way out there. That's like three feet over the wall and keep going until you, yeah. Um, but I guess it is a viable option. So I, there you go. There's a way to get Sebulba. If you really, really wanted to use them, there's a way to do it. Bulb on table and Wado gets you cards plus more generation. Yeah, Dark Path seems to be a way. Yeah, a lot of people are using the Dark Path in, in Wado. Um, in order to get that activated, you do Endor Shield uh, and the. You cannot hide forever, which you then pitch to get either security precautions or search and destroy to give you extra activation or cause more damage, but that puts the second card in your lost pile with your starting interrupts, so then you can then use the dark path to stack the two cards and put them on the sites to get the extra activation that way um, and really get a big activation boost. Um, it's a very, a very successful strategy that we've been seeing lately uh, with Watto, but 
you know, there's, uh, there are other ways to get extra activation and Najuba Na. Could be the right answer for somebody out there. Looks like we're just taking over the space and the board one bit at a time. He force pushed and he's got a barrier for the fist. Do we have a, a sense or a barrier canceller? Step one, grab. Step two, cancel. Got like five emperors in that deck. No senses? Ugh. That's disappointing. All right. We're going to hop out of this game because it's going to take forever and a day. And it's not going to be overly interactive. It will, it'll, we'll come back to it if we can. Um, we talked about online weekend. We've got spoiler number two to go up with that. Uh, a lot of other stuff going on. And the forums, forums are kind of quiet right now, but, you know, these other events coming up. So try and find one in your area. There also are lots of league events, different leagues in different areas that are active. And a number of state championships and regional events coming up this summer. Um, if you go to the 2019 tournament season, you can see some of these events coming up. Uh, now, HUD Regionals was just last weekend. Um, that was in Indiana. You've got this one coming up in Nebraska. Wisconsin State's coming up. Colorado's got a couple of events, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people will still be adding events as well over the next uh, couple months here. We have to get New Jersey states somewhere on there, you know? I mean, come on, Chris Kelly, let's go. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure that we will see uh, a lot of other events. I know, uh, you know... Uh, California States was there. They've got their regional that they're going to get scheduled. Seattle, I'm sure, is going to do something. Uh, maybe there'll be an event up in Massachusetts States, Connecticut States, something up there. Those guys always like to get stuff done. Usually people try and people tend to just forget about this stuff and kind of push it all off. And then it's like the last week of August in the first. Oh, wait, the last week of August is Continentals. Um, yeah, so, okay, so Labor Day weekend. Let's try and get it. Oh, who? Labor Day weekend. People go out of town. They go down the shore. They go you know, to the beach or whatever for the weekend. So, yeah, don't wait until the last minute because you're going to be running into uh, some tight spaces and deadlines with that kind of stuff, with Continentals and then Labor Day weekend and all that. So get your states and regional tournaments booked. All the event that you need to do to get that taken care of is all right here. Uh, and then you just have to go to the PC store as well and purchase the, uh, the kit. So you get the vouchers, you get some foil cards and some other prizes to hand out at your events. Um, so you want to make sure you get that taken care of nice and early so we have time to get all that stuff mailed out to you. Online play spoiler card numero dos. We, so, we showed the light side one earlier. If you missed it, we'll do it again real quick. It was Kit Fisto. And the dark side one, dun 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 Supreme Leader Snoke. Ooh. <laughs> that one's pretty cool, also. I like that very much. Good job this year, guys, picking these foils and, uh, and figuring out which of those uh, to use this year. Very happy with how they turned out and how they look. And very excited to get these mailed out into the hands of all the players as soon as possible. Uh, we will jump into our featured game of the week. And then we will circle back to some other stuff, including our last set 11 spoiler, which is a light side card. We did one light side, one dark side. Thank you to Chris Kelly, our design advocate, for uh, sharing those. Need some Texas tournaments on this list? Yes. Texas tournaments would be nice. we got to find some guys in Texas who still uh, are active and want to play said game of Star Wars. Used to be Texas Mini Worlds, but a lot of the Texas players stopped playing, and a lot of the out-of-staters therefore stopped traveling. You know, if you're going to have 20 people at an event and 15 of them are from out of town, you might as well just hold that event somewhere else. So what do we got here? Ryan Serson sent us game link number two. Ryan was kind enough to send us the uh, this one who compiled the list which I don't think I showed off. Eh, I closed the forums. Eh, 
we'll go back to it. Uh, so Ryan compiled all of my weekly shows into a handy little spreadsheet with all the game links and everything like that. It's in the original post on my forum page um, for the weekly show. And, uh, you know, he pulled up some stats for us of decks that we haven't seen a lot or featured a lot on the show. Carbon Chamber testing being one of them. So Ryan went and played some games with some of those uh, decks. Last week it was mine, which you have learned. Uh, this week he's submitting Carbon Chamber Testing. It's a 12-card CCT. Uh, we haven't seen this deck too much in a while. A lot of the 12-card CCT decks used to, you would take uh, a Rebel as a prisoner, and then you would try and freeze him real quick and cause 8 force loss. Um, the relatively unprotected card, which a number of decks do play light side, uh, it does curtail TTO damage. It does curtail the carbon freezing. Uh, it's also just a Destiny 7 that makes a starship immune to attrition less than, or subtracts 4 from the immunity of a starship. So a starship that's already immune to 4 or 5 is now immune to less. Um, something bigger like the Executor or the Finalizer, which is immune to like 8 or 10, uh, is now back down into uh, the possibility of a single Destiny being good enough to crack its immunity. Um, so that's why that card does see some play, which is enough to, of a deterrent to uh, to kind of make people shy away from the carbon freezing version of this deck. So Ryan's going to go 12 cards, uh, and then usually you'll run two to three copies of Ig and possibly a copy of Darrow. I believe he's the one that pulls a, a droid, um, so then you can deploy him and get excuse me, dinner repeating on me a little bit, uh, and get a copy of that. So what Iggy does here, if escorting a captive, take any one card from Force Pile into hand. He's basically the engine that drives the deck. You start with the captive who's frozen, you deploy Ig, you pick him up, and then once per turn, so on basically the same way QMC works, uh, you just go through your Force Pile and pick a card. So then you don't really need to do a lot of drawing blindly looking for stuff. It opens up a lot of options for you to save cards in your force pile. So then you can deploy multiple things each turn because you just keep cherry picking all the good pieces out of your deck that you need for that exact situation. A lot of us can refer to this as a toolbox deck because uh, you're finding the right tool for the right job. It does make it a much more complicated deck to play for newer players because you have to know what the right card is to take in the right scenario. Um, and a lot of newer players aren't quite sure of those in-game decisions, uh, and it can definitely take a lot of practice before you really get comfortable with it uh, and start to have success with it. So not a deck I would recommend for newer players. Um, certainly can be fun, but um, you know, you're going to find yourself in a lot of difficult situations where you're, you're going to start second-guessing yourself as to what the right cards are to take, and uh, that can suck some of the enjoyment right out of it for you. Uh, he'll be playing against a... This looks like EBO. We've got a new secret base, strike planning, walkling. Uh, looks like Hoth. Looks like an EBO deck. Yep, Snoke definitely looks pretty cool. Uh, Minnesota last weekend in July. Okay, good. Then hopefully they'll get that uh, registered and paid and on the books and all that fun stuff. No, we didn't do. We didn't go over what the objective does. We don't see this objective very often. So you start with the Carbonite Chamber and something imprisoned there. Uh, you can go get the Audience Chamber and a couple of Docking Bays, but you can't play Dark Deal because this is an easy way to set up Dark Deal because you already have two sites on the table. You just get a third and then, uh, bam, Dark Deal. So they limit you to not being able to do that. But you basically get a free audience chamber out of it and possibly docking bays. Most people don't run these docking bays. This is what you would use if you wanted to walk somebody uh, over. Uh, the Sith probe droid also seems like a viable option, which we'll take a look at in a second. Uh, flip this card if you move a frozen captive to the audience chamber or if they didn't have any rebels in their deck at the start of the game. If you start with Jabba's prize instead, they don't give you a rebel, so then you have to flip it by moving in order to flip your objective. A lot of people don't flip. There's you know, there's some benefits on the backside, um, but you usually sometimes it's just more of a platform just to set some stuff up in the beginning. And you uh, you don't necessarily need to uh, to flip this objective. But if you do, what do you get? Aliens and independent starships immune to less than four. Once during each of your control phases, retrieve a force. Well, that's pretty good. 
While you have a frozen captive at audience chamber, scum and villainy is immune to alter, and during your deploy phase, you can deploy scum from reserve deck. Okay, so CCT scum. You start with a frozen captive, you deploy a droid, so you're not violating your scum. You uh, get the audience chamber out, you can use the audience chamber to pull Jabba, Jabba pulls scum, and then if you had like some Sith probe droids to get over there, you could flip and then now you're retrieving one force in your control phase. Your aliens are all immune to less than four. You'd be retrieving two for initiating battles with scum. Uh, there might be something there. Might be, it's probably a little card intensive to pull off, but uh, it could be you know a fun, a fun tier two level deck. Uh, and then you flip back if there are no frozen captives on table, unless of course there was no rebel, in which case the deck stays flipped the entire time. And then Jabba's Prize has some text on it as well. It's a Persona of Han. There is a light side shield that replaces this with Corrin Horn. Um, so that way if Han is important to your deck, say you're playing something like Old Allies that's a little more uh, reliant on Han, then you would use that and you would substitute Corrin Horn for Han. Uh, you can't target it by a bunch of stuff. While Jabba's Prize is at Audience Chamber, Jabba's Power plus 3, Defense Value plus 3, and plus 3 Immunity to Attrition. Uh, and then if it gets released, they can replace it with any Han out of their deck. But having Jabba be Power plus 3 and Defense Value plus 3 certainly makes him seem like he would live longer. CCT's auto flip against hyperdrive and its ability to find malls easily can be a huge pain. Yeah, starting flipped against certain decks can be very beneficial. Um, you know, WAP is a deck if you're not playing the 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 Jabba's Prize. Um, there are certain decks that yeah uh, that are only playing like the Episode One characters that are only allowed to play Episode One characters like hyperdrive and WAP. Um, where you're just going to start flipped, and then you get to verify their entire deck to confirm that they don't have any rebels in there, um, which is uh, <laughs> a bit of a unique advantage. But uh, I always preferred starting with the CCT, you know, starting with the Java's Prize, just slapping Ig down and and running with it. Um, again, if you play two to three copies of Ig and other ways to pull them and force pushes and that kind of stuff. Uh, you can usually get them out pretty reliably between two Ig, Darrow, Force Push, that kind of uh, point man, whatever. Um, you can usually get them out pretty quickly. Uh, even a Sith Fury or two in case you happen to draw them for Destiny. Uh, the other way to do it, of course, is the Any Methods Necessary start, which lets you take a Bounty Hunter into hand, so then you just deploy Ig first turn and do that. But then you only start with six cards, and yeah, not quite as used to be the preferred way of playing it, but the 12 card start seems to have worked out better mathematically for enough people that uh, this seems to be the new preferred way to start the deck. So he gets the audience chamber, he happens to have the castle in hand, that's the other advantage of the 12 card start, you get 6 extra cards in your hand, so even if you don't find Ig, chances are you're going to get some extra activation. We're going to go turn one Vader. We're going to go with surface defense. He's going to get despair. Opponent's characters deploy plus one to same site as Jabba's prize. When you capture a character, opponent loses a force. Your force drains that same battleground as Jabba's prize are plus one, and the objective cannot be placed out of play. Okay. Flip side of the objective goes out of play. Oh, place out of play. If there are no, so you don't flip back, you just go out of play. Okay. I misread that earlier. Alright, so they deploy plus one to Java's prize, all of their characters, and your four strains are plus one if this is at a battleground. Okay. Um, whether that's what he was looking for, whether he was looking for I am your father, maybe? Sometimes they also run one or two copies of that in this deck along with his lightsaber, but I didn't see a lightsaber. So maybe that was in his force pile as well. EBO, we've talked about a number of times. They're going to do their traditional setup. They'll use a new secret base to get their two echo locations. They'll use strike planning to get a couple of generals. They'll deploy them to the ground sites. 
draw a couple cards. Oh, he's going to use Mothma. Interesting. She gets Chandrilla, which gives you a one turn, ex another activation acceleration, or one fewer pulls with the new secret base to get your systems and stuff out early. He's going to use Walkling and take Haven into hand and then just call it a day. And there's Ig going to the audience chamber. So the Sith Probe Droid works. Use two force to relocate a Dark Jedi with any captives they're escorting to same site. So you can... Vader will pick him up. The Sith Probe Droid goes... Well, you deploy the Sith Probe Droid here. Vader takes the captive out, then during the move phase you relocate by moving Vader with the captive to the audience chamber, and then the probe droid goes to the use pile, and then Vader would transfer the captive um, to IG-88. Because it's a frozen captive, you can do that. I don't think you can just transfer regular captives outside of a prison. There's some weird captive rules that I'm not 100% familiar with because I haven't captured a lot of guys in the last handful of years. So he'll do that, he moves over there, and now he flips. And because the spare's on the table, the objective wouldn't flip back. Yeah. Because he's a frozen captive, you can leave him unattended, and then Ig can pick him up and take custody. And then you can use Ig's text and grab a card you want. And you grab the card... On your turn that you need, don't draw, don't draw. You don't need any more cards, you're just going to go dig them out. And then bam, you're like, oh, I'll take that. Well, none of those cards really look great. Um, you're probably not going to need EPP Maul against uh, an EBO deck, because everybody's either going to be in space or in speeders. But Ooh, he's slipping the expensive way. You haven't used Anakin. So he might be playing speeders after all if he's got Anakin and this kind of stuff in there. Usually we see some leaderships and like the admirals or just another cheap guy. Now he's going to deploy the Lightmaker, which is the one ship that can't hold any people. And OB and Radiant 7 as well. Simple tricks to stop the retrieval. Battle plan to make him pay for the drain of two. Ray as a pilot aboard Obi. That'll get him a card out of the use pile, which may possibly get him another ship, which he could uh, hopefully deploy and then shuttle up Anakin. Mothma's going to move over. I guess she'll move up too at some point for extra forfeit fodder. Here comes the interesting parts now, is when you get to activate. So you activate 12 force plus the couple you've saved from the previous turn, and it's like, there you go, tunnel vision, go get any card you want. And it's like, all right, well, what card do I need? And you look at this and you think to yourself, well, Mara in Decimator looks pretty tempting right about now. Uh, you know, you want a spaceship, they've got, they're battling in space, a barrier could also be helpful. A lot of this other stuff, not so much. Search and Destroy could be a very good card as well. Um, that's actually probably the one I think I would take in the situation, would be Search and Destroy. To start getting some extra damage through on a repeating turn, force your opponent to go to the ground somewhere where you could then engage with them. So that would be the one that I would be likely to get, especially with Dooku already in hand. And that is the one that Ryan takes as well. Glad to see we agree. He can't retrieve. Dooku goes. He can pay to drain here and gets control tunnel vision. Okay, whoop de do. That sucks, but hey, you're not really using all this force anyway. And you just get a whole bunch more because now you've got your bridge. Dooku goes to the uh, carbon chamber phrasing, uh, the carbon night, the carbon the, the carbonite chamber, and then you slap the search and destroy down, which says unless opponent occupies a battleground site with a character of destiny less than four, they lose a force during each draw phase. And as long as you have two sites with guys occupying. So as long as he keeps both these guys alive, which is very likely to happen, especially in this particular matchup, 
because EBO is not known for running a lot of ground characters. Take the Gick. Um, so this will be one damage every draw phase, kind of like Visage, where it hits on both turns. Um, and that's kind of what can um, really pull a game away here. You're not doing lots of... It, it's lots of little pings. It's the death by a thousand paper cut approach. But uh, it can be very effective. Now he's got a Tantive, so now he can move some people up. He's got a way to shuttle. And then I'm sure he'll slide one of these ships over probably... Interesting. I guess he is running a speeder or two then for ground. And he's going to try and find them and put Anakin in the speeder to make it harder to shoot. Um, it didn't look like he's running Echo Base Garrison to pull the matching Lukes and speeders the way we see some of the other decks. So maybe he's just floating a couple of speeders or like a blue 11 or whatever vehicle. And then he'll just use Anakin with that and, uh, and slide people around. Ryan has his two battlegrounds now, so he does get to retrieve. And he's got another big pile of stuff to choose from. He opted to take the shuttle, which is good because he's got Emperor and Tarkin. He doesn't have a barrier canceler, and he thinks the way that this is setting up here is that if he goes to space, he is going to get battled. He's foregone the force draining. Would just be drains of one and one. Silver Glen with ten cards in hand and, and plenty of force with which to work. Have to remember too that Spiral only costs one to react. It's actually free to Hoth because of Haven and EBO and the deployment modifiers there. Um, and then there's also the red eight X Wing that also deploys as a react for one free to Hoth because of the Haven modifier. So uh, Hoth is a no-go. Stay the hell away from Hoth. Um, but even this feels like a little bit of a setup. And without a barrier canceler, I would be very hesitant to d deploy this without a barrier of your own to, uh, to protect your guys behind uh, for the counterattack. This seems, this seems very suspicious to me. But he's going to go Emperor Shuttle, whatnot. He'll make him pay the extra two. It's usually not worth the Force uh, commitment, but... The other thing to also remember with EBO is that the plus three power that... EBO adds is only during battles, so Jemp does not reflect that outside of battles. So right now this looks like, oh, it's just 8-4. to four. That's a pretty reasonable battle here. Um, but it's about to be 11-4, to four, which is a little bit more of a of a difference. He's going to leadership and take Radis, and the leadership was not grabbed. I'm wondering what he was waiting to save the grabber on instead. Um because that certainly seems like a prime candidate to grab, especially in a situation where your main space package is this shuttle that's used to drawing three Battle Destiny at a time, and he just took an Admiral into hand that he could then play Leaderships with to limit you to one Battle Destiny. Um, I'm wondering what he was saving the grabber for, because that seems like that would have been a pretty good one to grab. The way this game is going to play out. If they're not going to have much on the ground to contest. Um, now, they might have things like it could be worse, and maybe you're saving a grabber for that. That could certainly be um, a reasonable uh, card to save a grabber for as well. You do see that a lot. I don't know if he has two grabbers in his deck. I don't know if he has the Omni Box, it's worse combo, uh, or senses or anything that would uh, allow him to just cancel that stuff outright. So... I feel like he did have at least one or two senses in his deck. I think felt like we saw those earlier. So uh, there certainly are some options here. So 
surprised he didn't limit him. Well, uh, limit him. He doesn't have an admiral there to limit him. So Tarkin adds the battle destiny, so it's going to be three for dark side, two for light side. The other advantage to uh, this IG method is to flesh out some of your lower destiny characters as much as possible. I don't know that I would have done that on P59. I mean, it's nice because you need him to help shoot the speeder and stuff like that. But I might have held it back in case I drew an extra one of those Vaders or Mauls for Battle Destiny. That's Sith Fury. It looks like it's going to work out for him just fine. With a couple of fives here. So if he draws a one here, then I'll have him proven right. Oh, that's a sense. Okay. So he does have senses in the deck. So he gets 13. 13 should be enough to get rid of the Tantiv and Hera. And we'll see if Lightside can draw high enough to at least force any uh, overflow damage. Doesn't look like it. A B Wing Bomber. Rut row. What does this do? Fire two more weapons during battle. Each of its ion cannon weapon destiny draws is plus three. That doesn't seem good for a maneuver three starship. That was Hera. It was on the Tantive, Dan, if you missed it. So he loses Hera. He loses the Tantive. And for a moment, Ryan has a false sense of security that he's in pretty good shape. He also has three battlegrounds, so he wisely pulls resistance. That'll make the drain at the Hoth system only two. And he's going to pull Kamiri Big Coward. That'll help limit any possible retrieval. He could... Don't... Don't... Stop drawing. I know you need cards in your hand. At least make it bluff like you're looking for something. But you can just go get any one of these cards out of your force pile next turn. You don't really need Mushtafar at this point. You certainly don't need Darrow. Take the barrier. That's what you do. You get the offensive cards on your turn, so you can go attack. You take the defensive cards on your opponent's turn. So that way you can keep your guys safe. Ooh, Bith Shuffle combo cancels the barrier. That's not so good. Hey, there's that Radis guy. So now he's got an admiral on his. And all this stuff is deploying a little bit cheaper. And that's a killer. Gold leader in gold one is a monster. Uh-oh. Well, we're going to hold off on this and pause for a second because this is about to get interesting. So... Gold leader and gold one. Opponent may not react to here and must first use one force to draw a card for battle destiny here. So draw a card, pay a force. Draw a card, pay a force for destiny. So you need three force available in order to pay to draw all the maximum destinies. Ig should have plenty of force available, but he spent force drawing these cards, which he none of them were good. He looked at his force pile. You know, he could have looked at his force pile when he had six cards in there and in knowing, you know, and taking the best one. Um, that's why, one of the other reasons why Ryan didn't need to draw as many cards as he did last turn, so he would have had four or five cards in his force pile available in case something like this happened. Now, Lieutenant Tarn Mizen, Mizen, whatever, is a card nobody really sees very often, so you can't expect this guy to be showing up. If you are thinking about this guy, um, you're either a, a genius or a madman or somewhere in between. So what does this guy do? 
Adds power to starship, deploys minus one aboard. When starfighter he pilots, fires a starship weapon, characters aboard target are forfeit equals zero for remainder of turn. It's one of the most busted game texts uh, ever created. Starship weapons are not that great for the most part, um, but all he has to do is just fire the weapon at the ship, and every character aboard it is now forfeit equal zero for the rest of the turn. So if you crack the immunity to the ship and it has to lose, if you lose one immunity, you can't forfeit any of the people on it. You could have ten people on the executor, and it's like, great, it's no longer immune to attrition for something. I cracked its immunity, lose one. And you're like, oh, the only thing I can lose is the ship, and there go all the pilots with it. Because Lieutenant Tarn Mizen fired a Bobo weapon against it. Uh, yeah, people think light side space weapons are a little ridiculous. It's cards like that that tend to agree with it. Um, doesn't see play very often, thankfully, but when he does, it's usually not a good time. The Proton Torpedo deploys on a variety of weapon of ships, your little snub fighters. You spend a force to target, you draw destiny, it's hit if destiny greater than defense value. The, the beauty, uh, the main component of it is not trying to hit the ship. That's just an added bonus. Um, it's really just making everybody abort it, forfeit, equal zero. So that way, when they do have to get outpowered 19 to 4, and you're like, all right, start peeling some characters. Um, yeah, you're just like, well, these guys are all forfeit zero, so I have to lose the ship and still... It's like a complete space beatdown package uh, all in one there. Pretty crazy stuff. Someone page Taco Bill. Yeah. Did he mean to put Lightmaker in and just forgot the virtual slip? No, Lightmaker's over here. There's the Lightmaker. It's parked at uh, Hoth Protecting Haven. Good thing he has Gick. Yes. Good thing he has Gick because he is certainly going to need it in this scenario. Yep, there's the blue 11. Anakin will get it in that, and then I think I'll move out to the uh, fifth marker here. Ooh, first strike's also going to get enforced and cause a force loss for each player. Throw away that Mustafar. Certainly don't want to use it. You don't want anything to do with space at this point. He'll get cute here. His opponent retrieved a force, so now play the imbalance combo to make him lose a force. Oh, he's going to pitch Darrow instead. I guess he's going to clutch the system in case he can deploy it later in the game and get his own ships there, but light side's just going to take it from you. Um, hang on a second, because I just had a thought, and I believe this works. It's the Lana Dobreed Sacrifice combo, right? Nope, it's only on the light side one. Oh, it's almost as if, you're, if the weapon is to be hit, you prevent its forfeit from being reduced. I was wondering if this combo protected your guys from having their forfeit reduced by Tarn Mizen, but nope, it does not appear that that works. Well, that's a bummer. thought maybe there was at least an out there. So he shot and he missed, but the dudes aboard are forfeit zero. So there ain't nothing good going on there. And he's down 24 to 4, so he's down 20. Ouch. A lucky Phantom Menace cuts it to 13. But considering the pilots that went on board don't forfeit for anything, and the shuttle only covers five, it looks like he's he should be playing the Gick here. Now, Ryan secretly told me ahead of time that in this situation he didn't play the Gick, and he was wondering if it was the right decision. He felt like because he had big a huge card, a bit of a card advantage, that if he could peel 13 cards and keep this in space and keep the ground pressure on, that uh, it would end up working out better for him. But... I feel like he's going to peel 13 cards here, 
so he can pay to drain. So he doesn't have to pay to drain the next turn, and he cuts a force drain from three to two here. But then these guys are just going to get battled on the next turn and get you know quite a bit more of the same damage. It's just going to come right back to him. Now, granted, he can save some extra force to make sure he can draw multiple destinies. Now that he knows that this is coming, um, but there's no point in piling up guys for forfeit. It doesn't look like he has any others. Maybe you can find that Mara ship to at least give him some more power. Um, oh, but their Mara ship just goes right off the top. So, yeah, it would almost feel like you would just concede it at this point. And he moves the Obi over. Yeah, I think I, what I would have done in this situation, I would have just been like, okay, so this is what my opponent's playing. This is the kind of stuff he's playing. I want nothing to do with him in space. Um, you know, I'll go take over his fourth marker to get my three battlegrounds back for resistance to make these drains two and two, which I will then make him continue to keep paying for um, while I'm paying for my drains of one and one, but also doing two damage a turn and retrieving a card from this and possibly a first strike retrieving a card as well. Um, and hopefully that will pull me ahead between the extra cards EBO puts on the table and whatnot, just from a card efficiency standpoint. Because, I mean, here you're basically almost in a situation where this has to move away. So you have to move to Hoth, where your immunity has now been canceled by the Lightmaker. He only has two cards in hand. We'll assume one of them possibly... Ray can draw a card, of course. Um, but there's a possibility that one of them is a starship. So Lightmaker plus another ship. Oh, God. Not at all what I was expecting. You think he just moves this away. He pe he peeled 13 cards to keep this. And he's outpowered eight by 18. And he's going to just battle, retrieve a force with first strike. And, you know, try and draw his three destiny and try and clear a whole bunch of this stuff. But I think all he's going to end up getting, realistically, best case scenario, he draws a couple of fives and he gets 15 and he gets profundity and ray. Meanwhile... Now he's got to peel more cards to keep this, or pitch it, in which case he would have just pitched it last turn. He almost would have seen to move to Hoth. Um, if you're really concerned about protecting it and you peeled 13 cards to keep it on the table, uh, using it to battle right back into the weapon, I mean, does it cost a force to shoot, right? So maybe that's what he's thinking. Um, that he can clear a bunch of this out and then pitch it, because or pitch something off of it, because his guys won't be forfeit zero. I don't know. It still seems... It seems kind of risky to me. Those guys are fives, by the way. The Sith Probe Droid is plus two when drawn for battle or weapon destiny. So that's not so bad. He seems to be playing a lot of them, though. Which I guess you'd want to do if you want to get the, the early Vader move thing. Uh, that would be the seven that he drew last turn that he just happened to track back to. So yeah, he's going to draw pretty well with these three cards. I don't know, maybe if you think if he's going to get 12 and then maybe... Oh, Sith Fury that. Now he's going to have to spend a force again to draw because the gold leader is actually spending four force to draw his three battle destiny this turn. All right, so he gets 16, so he gets all the way to 20. But he's still down by six. So then it becomes, well, now what do you do? He's going to peel seven more cards. Yep. 
Yep. He's going to peel seven more cards. And his opponent is going to lose everything except the gold leader and the Tarn Mizen. So he's now lost 20 cards in two battles. Well, 19 because he retrieved on first strike uh, to keep this thing afloat. So he's basically lost a third of his deck in two space battles simply to keep himself from having to pay to drain. Bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Mothma moves over. We'll see if the speeder move over, I'm sure. Brings the Lightmaker over now. Oh, he did not have any ships, so the gamble pays off for a little bit there. Because now the shuttle can run away to Hoth, cancel Haven, which is at least a little bit helpful. And his opponent is getting fairly low on cards. He's no longer losing to Search and Destroy. He'll take the sniper. Yep. I'm sure we'll be seeing an EPP mall here in a second. He will get the train for one and one. But yeah, he really has to get the search and destroy going again, so he really has to clear out that site. Nuke Gunray is not really doing a whole lot. You can cancel a Republic character's text. Probably not often that that's going to work. Uh, character with Trade Federation in Lord, that should be P-59, right? Trade Federation, yep. So he adds a battle uh, destiny to, what's that? A, adds one battle destiny, okay. Now this is going to be a very productive battle. These are usually the kind of battles that Darkseid wants to get involved in. Are ground battles with hit and run EPP malls and things like that. He's going to try and pick off some people with weapon swings and blaster shooting. So Maul swings at Anakin and misses. Did he check his destinies at all? I don't think he had anything he could have looked for, though, but Maul will try again. There you go. Big seven. That'll definitely hit him. And then you can sniper Anakin and get him out of here. And then I think if I'm in this situation here, I'd use P-59 and just shoot Mon Mothma. She's only ability 3, as opposed to blue 11, which is maneuver 4. She's slightly easier to hit. You don't really care about him keeping the vehicle. You care about him keeping characters, because characters are what he needs for search and destroy. So I think I probably just take the shot at Mon Mothma, just to make sure you hit her. Cause the 2 force loss. There you go. You would have hit either one, but you don't always know that, so... You play the odds, and you know you've got some threes in your deck with things like sense and whatnot, so you hit the guy you feel confident that you can hit and just cause some damage and make him peel some more cards in the process. You add the battle destiny with Newt Gunray, and you'll probably end up losing Newt when your opponent draws back. He's 
gonna pitch Maul. I'll be honest, I probably would have thrown away Newt here and kept Maul. Because he's gonna keep Leia. Leia's not the easiest to hit with P fifty nine, but she's a pretty easy to hit with Maul. And you run away to Hoth. Cancelled Haven. He gets a short little drain in. And Ryan's ahead here, 17 to 11 still. He's just going to top deck two. Oh, it's Bravo Fighter, and it's going to shoot the shuttle down. But it's only a two. Oh, actually, Bravo Fighter can't, because Bravo Fighter only shoots unpiloted stuff. Yeah. Well, a two's not going to cut it, so he's going to have to move the light maker. Oh, he's now he's just going to chase. He's going to bring everything back over. He swaps Tycho. Alright, so he just swapped some ships, so he's keeping stuff at both systems. You almost have to wonder if you're Silver Glen there, if it. I mean, you're losing anyway. Uh, to prevent your opponent from retrieving more force and things like that, because he's going to obviously battle you at first strike and cause some force loss. If it would have been worth it for him to initiate the battle with Leia, retrieve a force for battling with Leia, plus retrieve a force for first strike before she dies. So you get two cards out of it, but you end up and cause him one force loss. But you're probably just going to end up um, peeling those cards right back when she gets shot. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think you probably still net out ahead a little bit. But if you know your opponent has some good fives and stuff near the top of his deck, which it seems like he did, um, then you're just going to get Leia's shot. you got to take a chance that maybe uh, something else is going on. And a well-tracked seven again. Excellent job by Ryan tracking those around. Still gets the two battle destiny. Yeah, two battle destiny is good. Forfeit zero is better. I don't know. She forfeits for eight, so you add a battle destiny. The best you can do is add seven. If you take her forfeit away, she forfeits for zero. You've just subtracted eight. And if he had a leadership, he could have played it there to limit you to one. Ouch. So it looks like Ryan is going to end up winning this game. His guys are immune to the destiny of one. Leia's gone, and he has two overflow, and then he's going to lose to search and destroy. And this is, uh, yeah, just run back to Chandrilla kind of thing, or you can just battle and go crazy. You retrieve one, you make them lose one. You've got the force to pay for the destiny. Now you don't care about losing the whole thing, because you're so far ahead. Your head 17 to 4. Search and Destroy is going to finish the game off in two turns. And there you go. He shot the shuttle. Woohoo! I shot the shuttle. Don't forget, we still have one more set 11 spoiler to review once this uh, game wraps up here in the next half a turn.
draws a bunch of destiny. What do we got? We got a 4, we got a 3, and a 5. So he's got 12. That'll be enough to clear everything. So everybody dies. At Hoth. And Ryan will still win this game. Even though he peeled 20 cards in two space battles just to keep his Emperor's shuttle alive. He still comes out ahead by quite a bit. And Silvergon's going to go ahead and throw in the towel. Best case scenario, he activates four. He drains for two more here. He throws away the two cards in his hand. And Ryan wins by 17. You have to make sure, of course, that he doesn't... Uh, well, he's going to lose one in the draw phase. I'll take him down to three. So yeah, he could pay to drain. Then he's got to lose one to search and destroy, which means he can't even afford to pay to drain anymore. Uh, and then he gets to retrieve a card, so you're almost better just drawing up to prevent him from getting to the one retrieval. So thank you to Ryan for sending over that game link. Certainly an interesting take on CCT, letting us see some of the mechanics, of course, of how the deck normally runs, plus the added bonus of the Sith probe droid tech and the uh, uh, objective being flipped for most of the game. Um, limited space package, just the Emperor's shuttle and the Mara ship, it looked like, for the most part. Um, you know, you'd th usually you'd expect, if you're going to flip, that you might see, like, a bounty hunter ship like a Zuckus or something like that, at least in there. Maybe it went by in the pile of 20 cards he peeled, and we just missed it. Um, but otherwise, pretty solid. Search and Destroy certainly uh, doing its job, causing quite a bit of force loss in this style of matchup. It is a very good EBO counter, because they do have trouble uh, maintaining a ground presence, and, uh, you know, much like the map blaster matchup, just having, it can mitigate things with the drains, but having the extra damage from that one extra card, whether it's a blaster ping or search and destroy or something like that, um, can be just enough to, uh, to, to pull it ahead of the big EBO space drains. So thanks to Ryan for submitting that link uh, for us to look at here. We'll go back to the old gem lobby. Not a lot going on. We'll go with our final Set 11, spoiler of the night. Dun, 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 dun. Commander Vanden Willard. Text, Alderanian. Well, that's important because Bail Organa does stuff with Alderanians, letting you add to your four strains there. Uh, Vanden Willard is also a rebel spy, so that will trigger a few other decks. Uh, once per game, may place your just lost Alderanian in used pile. So that would be Bale, Leia, and uh, I think like Beezer or somebody like that are, are Alderanians. Uh, there's probably a couple other ones. Uh, Antilles, those guys. Once per turn, if tapes delivered, a system liberated, or stardust on your spy. So those are three very deck specific helpers. Tapes delivered would be Diplo. System Liberated would be Yavin 4 Operations, or Stardust on your spy would be the No Idea They're Coming uh, Rogue One deck. Place a card from hand on used pile to draw top card of reserve deck. So he is 3PO. Um, but a 3PO with ability, a 3PO with deploy with better deploy forfeit. Um, a 3PO that can force drain and add one to a force drain and protect some people. So there's a number of different decks that he certainly uh, would give a boost to. Uh, as mentioned here, he's a low-ability rebel. Uh, what else does Vanden Willard have in his game text? I know he's a spy, because he's the one you always get, hope you get in the Premier New Hope sealed, because then he can go to uh, all the Death Star sites and drain big. Uh, he's a leader, rebel spy... So that's it. Okay. So certainly a few things that uh, 
he'll give a little bit of a, of a boost to those three decks. Seems pretty cool. Tycho. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's like five or six Alderanian guys. I forget all of them, but there are a handful of them. And uh, now you've got one more, and then he can give you the ability to loop one back. So if you happen to lose Bale off of your Tantive, or uh, he's not a pilot, he's just a warrior, though. Um, you know, or that uh, that Leia or Gana or whatever like that. He can uh, it's just lost. Doesn't even have to. It doesn't say here. So that would be a uh, universal trigger. It looks like. And then yeah, the three PO ability seems to be pretty good to help cycle through decks. So you don't have to waste spots on three PO and pullers. You can just play a guy who's a little bit more helpful to your deck. But they did restrict it, so it does only help these these limited decks and isn't just uh, just another spy that uh, any deck could use that would get this extra 3PO-like benefit. So that's pretty cool. Thank you to Chris Kelly for letting us spoil these two cards this week. So now we got two spoiled cards. We've got, uh, we showed off two uh, of the foil cards uh, for the online play weekend coming up this weekend. And uh, we watched some games. And I think that is going to wrap it up for tonight. Uh, thank you guys all very much for joining uh, the show tonight, participating in the chat. Uh, of course, don't forget to renew your subscriptions, and when you hit your 3, 6, 12-month milestones, make sure to uh, PM me with the screenshots of those so I can get that list uh, and get you the cool foils for that, which uh, I think I showed off last week. Uh, our 6-month foil, which some of you should be hitting Right about now, we'll close out the show with uh, was Ezra Bridger, who I believe is uh, the Rebels show. Yeah, there we go. Pretty cool. Foil Ezra. Original concept by Mike Jem. I know he's very excited to get this card in foil. Hopefully somebody will uh, send him one since he does not subscribe to our show. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in and watching the show this week. I hope everybody has a great week. And uh, get your OCS games in and get your online play games in this weekend. And then we will see you back here next Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. Same bat time, same bat channel. Take it easy.